Now we're going to be moving into our first panel regarding cybersecurity compliance. To moderate the panel, we have from the Illinois Institute of Technology, Ray, Ray Tregstard. Ray Tregstard. Thank you. Yeah, come up. I'd like want to invite my panel to come on up and, and have a seat, please. While my panel's getting seated, I'll, I'll reintroduce myself. I am Ray Trigstad. I'm the Associate Chair of the Department of Information Technology and Management at Illinois Tech, one of the founding members of that department. And I'm also Associate Director of our Center for Cybersecurity and Forensics Education. I've been involved in cybersecurity for a long time, and I started, honestly, in compliance as an information system security officer for one of the largest aviation training squadrons in the Navy way back, OK? Uh, so I'd like to do a quick introduction of our panel and then get right into our questions. Uh, first, uh, Elizabeth Ogunti started her information technology career as a help desk technician over 25 years ago and is now the chief information security officer for JBT Corporation's global information security program. Uh, Chuck Ruling. Chuck has been uh, the Chief Information Security Officer for Cook County Government since 2018. Chuck came to Illinois after working for the federal government and retiring from the military in 2011. Bruce Coffing has over 25 years of experience in information technology and cybersecurity with positions at Bank of America and Accenture and currently serves as the Chief Information Security Officer for the City of Chicago. Richard Warner, has been a professor at Illinois Tech College, uh, Illinois Tech's Chicago Kent College of Law since 1990, and is the faculty director of the Center for Law and Computers. Rich is the co-author of a couple recent books, The Privacy Fix, How to Preserve Privacy in the Onslaught of Surveillance, and Cybersecurity Cases and Commentary. He's our panel's legal expert on compliance. So I'm gonna jump right in with some questions and I'm gonna start each question with uh, directing it at one member of the panel and then let other folks jump in from there. So I'm start with Chuck. Chuck, uh, right. what do you feel are the goals, purposes, and benefit of compliance? All right, good morning everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I've worked in my last few years uh, in security actually trying to take compliance out of my vocabulary. <laughs> because I felt compliance for compliance sake didn't make sense. But I understand there's a number of you out there that wouldn't even be able to have a discussion with me if compliance wasn't in my vocabulary. So I'm slowly trying to get it back into my vocabulary. Oh, apparently I don't talk loud enough. Um, <clears throat> but uh, to me, compliance, the, the real goal, the real reason for compliance is to get your level of risk of operating your information system down to an acceptable level. You're never going to get it to zero. I don't care if you've checked every box in your list of compliance. You will just never get there. But you want to take the limited resources you have within your organization. You want to put them and focus them in the right direction to mitigate risk down to the lowest level possible, again, based on the resources you have available. At the government, you know, I've never, well, I've never been in a job that had unlimited resources, ever. So you, you literally have to utilize um, <clears throat> compliance or your frameworks, your risk frameworks, to get your, get your information systems, again, operating at a, at, a, at a level that your business, whether it be government, whether it be private industry, is operating at a, at a level of risk that your stakeholders are comfortable with. And that's, to me, that's the goal of compliance. <clears throat> Anyone else like to comment on this? Um, I'll chime in. Um, hello, everybody. Um, okay. So I agree with what you stated about compliance, but I just wanted to add also, uh, in my opinion, compliance gives you a common goal for your IT organization or your business uh, as a whole of a standard or rules uh, that you can follow and have your entire organization be on one page. If you choose NIST or whatever, that is our goal. Those are the, the, um, the controls that we have to get to a certain level of risk uh, within the organization. So for me, it helps to focus everyone on a specific goal when it comes to like IT controls and whatnot. And, <clears throat> And I 100% agree with the comments. I just wanted to add 
that a crucial element of reducing risk is having enough information about what the risks are, right? And so another goal of compliance you see in the statutes and regulations is information sharing because you need a picture of the, you need a picture of across the uh, organizations and across the internet of what the patterns of risk are. So information sharing is another critical goal of, com of compliance and sometimes problematic in the private sector. Okay, our next question, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to take this one first. Uh, being our representative of the private sector on this panel, uh, how do the compliance efforts differ between government and private industry? Well, I am in the private sector, but we also have government contracts, so we're on both sides. I don't really, I don't think that they differ so much because you still have to be in compliance with whatever body it is that you must follow, right? So if it's the government, government it might be CMMC, which is what they, they brought up now. If it's uh, the private sector, it could be SOX. It could be uh, some other framework or some other standard that you have to follow. So I don't think it differs so much on either side, actually. You still have to maintain that level of risk and you still have to be in compliance with that, whatever particular standard it is that uh, your business, because even, even on uh, like the food side or the, the, the produce side, you still have rules and regulations from higher organizations that you have to be in compliance with in order to be a profitable organization. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, whether you're in the government or in the private sector, if you're taking a credit card, you have to comply with PCI. PCI <laughs> exactly. is PCI irrespective of whether, you know, we don't get special dispensation because we're the government, right? right. So, um, yeah, so in the same thing in terms of, you know, echoing your, your comment from before, um, choosing your framework and, and building to that, um, that goal, whether, you know, it's NIST 171 or 853 or cybersecurity framework or CMMC, um, you know, whatever you've selected, you're building towards that. And, you know, that's common through, throughout, whether you're public sector or private sector. Any other comments before we move on? I don't, I want to go too fast. <laughs> 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 okay, the uh, next one uh, uh, I would like to uh, direct at Bruce because he's been in both the public and private sector and that is uh, how can an organization take advantage of compliance frameworks even when it's not bound by law to comply? Sure, no, and uh, I'll uh, steal Chuck's thunder when we were having our prep meeting for this. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, um, choosing your, free, you, can, you can look to um, other frameworks, other bodies, irrespective of whether or not you're required to comply to them. I mean, steal good ideas regardless of where they're located. So, you know, if there's a if there's a framework or a compliance requirement in something that has nothing to do with the industry you're in, but it makes good sense, adopt it, build it in, make it a part of uh, your model. So, um, definitely, uh, I'm a huge advocate of uh, stealing good ideas wherever they may be. Sorry, Chuck. Well, I, I give you more. For stealing uh, it. <laughs> let me give you a little more background on that one. So. Uh, as a government agency, you know, we're not bound by, uh, and I'll probably pronounce this wrong, but Sarbanes-Oxley, um, you know, it's, it's focused on uh, uh, financial institutions, right? But early in my tenure, um, uh, we, we, had an, we had an issue with our ERP system, and we had some paychecks stolen. Not a large amount, very, very small amount. We got in front of, you know, 90% of it. Uh, <clears throat> but, of course, the ERP people came to me and said, hey, what can we do to make our... ERP, our Enterprise Resource Planning System, be more uh, more robust. And one of the things we looked at is uh, is auditing. You know, so you you go look at Sorbanes Oxley, and and they've got a really good list of what you should audit as an information system. Again, we're not bound by that, but there's really good information in there, and, and gives you kind of minimum standards on what to look at uh, to audit for an uh, information system. And there's tons of examples out there, but that's just a kind of a grounded one that lets you understand, even though you're not necessarily tied by law to, to be compliant with, you should understand the frameworks, what they can offer, and reference them if, if it makes sense. 
I also think that having a, a common framework can help you when speaking with the business. Because if you have a, a common framework that you can explain and, and get them to understand the, the, the background of the controls and the risks around these different controls, that gives you a, a common language with which to speak with the business so that you're on the same page. I mean, even though they, they normally speak in financial terms, you can still tie that into financial um, outcomes when you're uh, speaking with the business. So that's one way that I use the frameworks that has been really helpful uh, in my position. Yeah, I, 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 well, you can see, I hesitated to speak. You can see that. Uh, so I have two points. If you're, I was giving you practical advice, I would say exactly what they said, right? You, you, what do I do about cybersecurity? I comply with applicable standards to me, and if they're unclear or they don't apply, I comply with best practices of the industry. That will give that will keep me out of legal trouble. That's what I would tell you as the practicing lawyer. Now, let me talk about let me talk like a law professor. The law professor criticism of those standards is that there's no guarantee that they actually meet the risk management goal. Your risk management goal is to spend up to well, theoretically up to the point where if you spent more, you'd, you would spend more than the expected loss you reduce, right? The, as the insurance people call this the shopping list problem. How much do I buy, right? Will you buy up to that point? There's no guarantee that the standards actually effectively approximate that goal. There's no guarantee, there's no, they may not, they may, they may. But so that's the problem, theoretical problem in cybersecurity is to step back from the standards and say, gee, are we really meeting our goal, right? So we got two things. The practical advice I give you, and we're gonna stick with that, it's hard to get the law professor edge in there and try to get people to think, well, are the standards really effective? So with that, I'll, I'll fall quiet again. Can I just say one thing sure. in response to that? But on the legal side, you have the, the term of uh, due care, yeah. right? So if you can show that you're at least following a certain standard, a certain framework to the best of your ability or to the best of your, your, your risk uh, oh. tolerance, right? If there were a situation, you could show that you're at least adhering to due care, is doing as much as you possibly yeah, can, yeah. right? Well, you, you make a, yeah. The, my, short answer, my short answer is yes, and that, that was my practical <laughs> advice. The longer answer is nobody's going to be able to show you're not exercising due care, what? right? Uh, if you adhere to those standards, because we don't have the information we need to come in and say, look, this this doesn't meet the goal. This really falls far short of the goal, the ideal goal I pointed out earlier. We just don't have that. And so in situations where the standards are vague, you see exactly what we're talking about and exactly the advice I would give and the practicing lawyers give, do what everybody else does. Well, right, And I, that I, defends you. And when, when, you, when I hear you say that, what I hear is the standards are the baseline, right? That's the floor, not the ceiling. There are the, the <coughs> yes and no. There are the practical baseline. I absolutely agree. The theoretical baseline, that's the dispute. Have we got the baseline right? Right? Sure. But, but that has nothing to do with the practice. I want to be very clear about that, right? There, there, I, have, I have two hats on. One is, one is, what should you guys do? And you got it absolutely right, right? And then, and then there's the, gee, should we really be doing that hat? And where, you know, welcome to my course. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sure. From my understanding of the Southern Doctrine or the framework, you know, the framework is just the garbage. Well, I, I think NIST addresses that by different uh, 
categorizations of information and, and different levels of categorization, so a low baseline versus a moderate versus a high baseline, and, and the different levels of controls you could put in. So even within a single organization, you can have multiple systems, and the systems all uh, protected differently based on the information they store, process, and transmit. So you, you're absolutely right. You're not gonna try and protect everything at the same level. It gets way too costly, and why are you protecting your least or your most uh, public information to the same level you're protecting your most private. So uh, I think NIST does address that. Uh, uh, I don't know that, <clears throat> I think, and a lot of the other frameworks kind of feed off of NIST, such as HIP, HIPAA, CGIS, uh, PCI DSS, and they just add a little bit more um, organizationally defined, or they define the organizationally defined values more strict uh, within those frameworks to, to give you a, uh, baseline to follow, but yes, uh, depending on the type of information you're protecting, you're going to want to implement a different level of control uh, within your organization, even multiple levels across multiple systems. And then I'll just add to it, depends on where that information is sitting. That's where you would have like the majority of your controls, is the criticality of the systems, like you were bringing up the ERP system, you might have a, a, a 30 or 40 controls it specifically are for that ERP system if those are your crown jewels. But then, you know, other systems like file servers, you may not. So it just depends on how you risk rate the criticality of these systems, the criticality of the layers of transportation or transport of that information within your environment. That's where you would want to have your, kind of like your main focus to ensure that you're doing your due care of, um, of uh, applying those controls and meeting those standards. Okay. What, one more comment? Sure. Yeah, so I, again, I practically speaking don't disagree with a word of what's been said, but let me suggest that there's something odd about uh, the security, uh, cyber security and, and the law. If you would ordinarily, we have a reasonable, basically we have a reasonableness standard, right? Take reasonable steps to defend your website. And if, if it were like everything else in negligence, you'd see, you'd have a range of legal cases from just egregious negligence, right? And then, and then you'd get up into, you'd, get, you'd be a spectrum, and you'd get up into the unclear cases, and you'd have legal decisions, and that spectrum of decisions would tell you what reasonable care is, right, from a legal point of view. What we see in the cases is just the egregious cases. Right, that's all you see. So something is different about cybersecurity in the reasonableness standard from our ordinary, our, ordi our ordinary treatment of negligence, and that is the theoretical concern. I, I, my analysis is well, that's because we've left reasonableness so vague, right, in terms of the actual ideal standard. But some, something's different, right? Not again, not to disagree at all with the practical advice, but there is something odd going on. Okay, I'm gonna make one quick comment to this before I chime in with the next question. Uh, I always tell my cybersecurity management class, hey, you can't spend a penny to defend an inkjet printer because anything you spend is gonna cost, is gonna be more than <laughs> buying a new inkjet printer. So, okay, our next question, I'm, I'm gonna go right back to Richard here uh, because this is clearly a law professor question. Uh, what cybersecurity related legal implications and aspects of compliance should be considered? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask that. <laughs> uh, oh, that is, it is a terribly complicated question. Let me answer by, by as briefly as I can telling you what we got, right? So we got what we've been discussing, right? The standards uh, of the, and they, they're, they spell out specific requirements. On top of that, we've got a bunch of federal and state statutes that tell you to take reasonable steps to secure your websites and your data. And we've got the common law and negligence tells you the same thing, right? And then we've got a bunch of state statutes that do the same thing and some of those create safe harbors. If you do X, Y, and Z, then you have perfect defense against, against your suits. And so we've got a mess. Of, we've got the reasonable in the standard, which I said absolutely the right standard. It's just vague because we don't have the spectrum of cases that lawyers ordinarily look at to tell you what's what, right? That's why we, that, we tell you do what everybody else does. And that is excellent practical advice. 
but still we don't have this we don't have the standards so implications for cybersecurity the no, the one i would stress right is the information sharing right we don't have the reason we can't hit that ideal is we don't have the information about cost of different types of data breaches and the probability of breaches. We have some, but we don't have enough, right? Ask the insurers. They, they really want to have that information, right? Because that's how they set premiums. And that, so you can see the problem there. And so infor, the information sharing aspect of the statutes is critically important, not just the standards to take prevent unauthorized access, but but to share information effectively with, each, with others. And so far we've done that only, we don't have any mandatory information sharing. Right? We only have voluntary. EU has mandatory information sharing now as proposed. So we need some sort of solution to that problem where we're going to stay exactly where I said, egregious cases and no spectrum. The practitioners, chime in on that. <laughs> well, I'll jump in. Um, I think we are getting closer to that. Um, the federal government is starting to require uh, information sharing in certain yeah. pockets. So, for example, the TSA um, has, over the past year, has been um, transportation security agencies, so I think airlines, um, have uh, been mandating um, timeframes and requirements for information sharing. So I think we're inching there, but you bring up a fantastic point in that, you know, if we're ever really going to, <coughs> excuse me, tackle the problem and, and get beyond where we are, we need to, we need to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I forgot the idea. We're, we're inching along, which is good. Yes. Any other comments on that one? Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to Bruce with my next question. Uh, what are some effective ways of working with compliance auditing and or monitoring agencies? Oh my. Um, so it's, I, I think it gets to a, a lot of what we've been able to talk about is, you know, talk, being able to show the controls that you have um, and demonstrate the program in a defensible way. So, um, you know, whether that is, you know, PCI DSS and showing your auditors that you're, you've got your controls in place around your cardholder data, whether that be HIPAA and showing that um, you have identified where um, your um, EPHI rests and that from, you know, kind of cradle to grave that you're um, managing and it's being able to tell the story um, and, and be able to tell that within the, the framework, you know, kind of as, if we've, as we've been talking about, the framework of the controls that you've built for your program. Other folks? I'll check. No, oh, go ahead. In my opinion, first you have to get IT auditors that actually understand IT. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is a bane of my existence over, I don't know. Uh, every IT auditor that has a CISA does not understand IT. And that has been a major problem in, uh, for me and my teams over the years. Uh, I agree with what you're saying as far as being able to show the picture, show the, tell the story. But if they don't understand all of the nuances around that story, it can be very difficult uh, when it comes time for them to uh, approve your evidentiary support or approve your, your control design. Uh, but in working with them, by telling that story, by somewhat educating them on how IT is not the same across the board for every organization, it can prove beneficial and it helps them in the next year, next go around when they have to come back because then they should already be familiar with, with uh, certain nuances around IT, but that to me is uh, how I've been able to work with our IT auditors and it takes, it takes some time because they, they switch in and out. They bring in, they bring in new testers and, and you know, different levels of IT auditors uh, every year. So it's kind of like round robin that we have to keep going around in circles and it does frustrate our teams because when they come in we expect them to understand just you know, somewhat of the basics 
not every system, because we do have different types of systems that may not be popular, but just the basics behind IT and how we function and, and how the controls are applied and how we go about trying to, to be effective within those controls. Uh, but uh, yeah, education of the IT auditor, I, that's, yeah, that's and, what I was And your IT auditor thanks you for training their green new uh, testers. Sure, <laughs> sure they do. I gotta tell the old joke. So what are the two biggest lies ever told during a security control assessment? It's well, by the assessment team, we're here to help <laughs> and the people being assessed and we're darn glad to see you. <laughs> but you have to build that relationship that she's talking about. If you're swapping your assessors out every time they come around to do an assessment, you're going to fail because you have to build that trust. You're, you're giving them access to some of your most critical infrastructure, whether your boss knows it is or not, and, and they're giving you a report at the end of the day that's telling you kind of, this is where you're doing good and this is where maybe you need some help. So you need to build that trust, that relationship and really work to have a team um, that, that remains somewhat constant. And I know there's a lot of churn in our organizations and a lot of churn in IT in general and especially on the cybersecurity side, but if you can make an effort to do that, it will pay huge dividends in the past and, and you'll end up going out to dinner with you know, uh, your IT team during the assessment because it usually ends up being about a week long you know, and you're out in that that organization, you're building that relationship and, and they will be happy to see you and it'll be a much better engagement in, in the end. Before I go on to our last question, I'm just gonna echo some experience of mine. I have had the, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to interface with a lot of the people who do certifications like ISC Squared. ISC Squared has a certification for accreditation officials and it's a terrible certification. It, 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 it calls for like no experience at all. And I've been arguing with ISC squared for years that that should be an add-on to CISSP. That people ought to at least have that level of knowledge before they're being sent out to you know, look, at, look at folks. Okay, the last question I'd like to toss out to the whole panel and have them all address it is, uh, are there any additional insights that you'd like to share before we take questions from our audience? Whoever wants to start, just jump in. I, I, don't, I don't have an insight, but I do have a question. <laughs> for people. To, to the extent you have experience with lawyers, do they understand enough technology? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. I think it depends, right? Um, and, and maybe I'm just fortunate um, that, uh, and it depends, and, and, I, and I'm taking your question with a slight twist. Um, so for example, um, you know, it, I'm very fortunate that we have an attorney that is just understands HIPAA inside and out, right? So the first time I met um, her, we sat down for coffee and she said, hi, uh, my name's Dory and I'm here to keep you out of jail. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? You are now my best friend. <laughs> so, you know, so it, do, do, uh, taking a twist on your, your, your question, you know, does she understand technology? Not to the extent that the IT professionals do, but she understands HIPAA inside and out and how it's applied to yeah. technology. So I, I think that's the, the slight, slight difference to, that, to your question. That was my question, because I mean, the law school and IIT's, one of its missions is to produce lawyers with some technology technology facility, let's say. Right, our, our alumni ask for it, by the way. They plead with us to produce lawyers with some technological understanding so you don't have your experience, right? But I'm afraid your experience is more typical than, than his. So, yeah, I just wanted, I wanted to confirm my suspicion that, you know, that in the next faculty meeting I can say, well, I, people told me, right? And we need to go forward, but we do, but we do need to go forward, to, not just on the assessor side, but on the legal advice side so we can play an effective role. Well, that's, well, I mean, IT, cybersecurity, security, information security, it, it's a broad, very broad topic, a very, mm -hmm. you know, it has a large scope. But I think if you have attorneys or, or that at least understand the basics behind mm -hmm. information technology and how you can secure environments, that would help 
when uh, dealing when dealing with with them because when I speak with some of our attorneys and I'm, you know they, mm -hmm. they don't understand yeah. and I'm not saying that they should understand everything because I I am the translator so I have to translate for <laughs> them yes when I'm speaking to the business is I have to translate that IT to the business but to just have that <coughs> that baseline knowledge yeah. would be is very helpful I, I could not agree more Ray and I are trying trying right yeah that's it yeah, yeah. Okay, let me steer it back to the question for the panel, though, which is uh, any additional insights that you want to share before we take audience take questions. First swing. <laughs> All right, I'll take a first swing. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I think kind of getting back to what we we're talking about earlier, and, and this is you know just hopefully common sense to folks, um, but you know figuring out what your framework is that you're, you're building your program, your controls against. Um, and then building the crosswalk of whatever the compliance requirements, regulations are to that so that you can say, we're compliant with our program and here's how our program supports HIPAA, PCI, DSS, et cetera. Um, you know, so that way you're not playing whack-a-mole on the standards you've built to your program and your program addresses their concerns. And I'll just add, uh I would recommend that you take a look at your environment and assess your environment as a whole. Risk rate, the criticality of your systems and uh, within your environment, and then apply, as you said, apply the different controls or different frameworks based upon that criticality. Because you need to communicate that to the business. You need to communicate, okay, these are our critical systems. This is the value, if they're, you know, if they're lost, but these are the controls that we've built around to help us protect these systems. And that way you can better uh, communicate the risk to the business and then formulate like the financial end of the, the risk or the loss as well. So I would just recommend that you know your, your environment as best as you can, where everything is sitting, what your crown jewels are, and then take a look at the frameworks to see which ones would work and you don't have to stick with just one like I think you said it earlier you can take controls from PCI and insert them into your own framework and then map your controls to the various frameworks out there that's what we've done so we've mapped we have our ITGCs which IT general controls and but they map to NIST 53 they map to NIST 171 they map to CMMC or whatever and then that way you can show that you are exercising due care and trying to adhere to that baseline that you've set as far as, um, what do you call it, industry standards. So keeping to the compliance side, um, <clears throat> so you've got information system owners out there or new owners that are really good at coming up with user requirements for your new information systems. They want, you know, what does your system do for us or, or what kind of information does it take in, what, what are the outputs? And then you've got your GRC personnel that are really good at writing policy and saying your information system has to do all this stuff in order to store, transmit, uh, and process information securely. You need to build out a function in the middle that helps translate between the two what I call an information system security engineer. And when they're building the system and building the, the user requirements in, make sure they're building the security requirements right alongside and developing them when your system is being built. Trying to bolt that stuff on later is only going to be more costly, more painful, and in some cases, not even, uh, uh, you're, you're not even going to be capable of doing that. So try to build that function to, uh, to, to bring those two bodies together in anything that you're that you're uh, producing uh, a new information systems that you're developing in your organization. Okay, we have just a few minutes left uh, for questions from the audience. So I have a gentleman here with a microphone who's going to get get with folks for their questions. Hey, good morning. So for the CISOs, could you tell us where in the organization you report to today, oh. and importantly? where you think you should be. And for our lawyer friend, same, same comment from a, you know, operational point of view from the law. Okay, good question. So go ahead. I'll take a first shot. So uh, I report to the CIO. 
Uh, I know this is a really passionate topic among security professionals. Um, frankly, I don't care um, as long as I have the ability to influence the organization to, to, to achieve the goals that we need to achieve from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, I think from a city perspective, where we are in our broader IT journey, it completely makes sense uh, for where we are right now because we need the greatest change and, and kind of raising the floor, uh, so to speak, uh, in the IT organization. So to be closely coupled and tied there, to me, makes sense today. Does that make sense forever? Likely not. But uh, I'd say for the foreseeable future, it makes sense for our organization. And I, I generalized, I think that's the right answer, right? You want to have a reporting structure that makes sense within your organization. So what I would do, I mean, if I were your lawyers, look at the details of your structure, right? And let's figure out a reporting, a reporting mechanism that makes sense in light of the statute and your organization, just so that it's effective. Right? So exactly like that. I, I know that's a typical lawyer answer that doesn't give you the details you want. It's just, unfortunately, it's the right answer. So even if he had not introduced himself as the lawyer on the panel, would you have been able to pick him out? <laughs> <laughs> so every, every job, so I've, at, at uh, NASA, the CISO reports to uh, the CIO. At Department of Energy, the CISO reports to the CIO. And here at Cook County Government, the CISO, CISO reports to the CIO, and it, and it works. And, and I and I I get the <clears throat> the argument about chief risk officer or or should they even retain it? I, I don't want to see it on the board. My gosh! But going back to to your point, you know, if you don't understand IT, what if you're working for someone that doesn't understand IT or the value of IT? So that's why I'm I'm more than happy to sit under the CIO and and work for him as, as his raider, even though I'm overseeing him and the cybersecurity of the information systems that he's responsible for. Oh, I report to the CIO. I don't have a problem with it. I mean, you bring up a good point, understanding IT and being able to have those discussions on a level where the person that you're speaking with understands what you're talking about is, is, is crucial. Uh, but in prior times, I might have said the CEO, but you do bring up a good, good point. Um, I want to comment kind of what, what he was saying is it, in the right now, there's a lot of conversation saying that when you talk about cyber, is it really technology related, right? Now you're using technology to, to drive your results, but is it really technology? And then the other piece that, that I'd like to hear more about is what's considered sometimes a conflict of interest from the CIO when the CISO goes and says, I need XYZ dollars, and he says, no, because I've got to do XYZ and you can't have that money. Well, I think within, within the construct of your relationship between the CISO and the CIO, IT and security or cybersecurity are, should be two separate budgets. I mean, they, they fall underneath the same house, so to speak, but they're, they're in my in my world, they're two separate budgets, um, and I have my own, and uh, she has hers. But uh, I could see where that might be a problem. But I think if CISOs are thoughtful in their requests or in their requirements or what they need, that they would probably be able to get, you know, what we need to function to secure our environments. Thank you. I have to do my role as moderator and. Oh, sorry. Uh, Okay, I'm getting asked if we could do one more question, but it's got to be very quick. One more question. Good morning. I'm curious if you, you're assuming you're following some kind of standards that, that are guiding your, your uh, needs in security for your business, what part does insurance, risk insurance play in guiding and, and, or forcing you to do things? You, your, your question is what part does insurance play in all of in And assuming this? cyber insurance? Cyber insurance. Well, for me, that's it's, I'd say over the past year or two since, was it SolarWinds? 
our insurance is really starting to get more vocal and more involved in, in cybersecurity. They're still learning themselves, right? And they're even coming to us for information or to me for information about certain aspects of security and cybersecurity and what we're doing, how we're implementing certain things, how effective our controls are. So yes, they're becoming more involved, but I think at least with my experience, it hasn't been too overbearing. They're not trying to dictate in my experience. <laughs> no, I agree. I, I feel like the, the things that we've been asked have been reasonable. They've been common sense. Right. It's so. kind of like an audit. I mean, another auditor per se, because now they're, they're sending questionnaires or they're, they're making you go through different ex exercises to show that your controls are effective or at least you're doing something to protect your environment or, and, and the crown jewels of the organization. I, yeah, I was just gonna add, uh, at the end of the day, to, on the agenda, Edward will be talking about cyber insurance topics, so make sure you stay okay. tuned for that. Well,